The chill in the air slowly turns to frost. The trees, once verdant green, become blanketed with white. The world is frozen, suspended in time. Like hibernating rabbits, people shore up in their homes, staying close and warm with raging fires and stiff drinks, fighting back the frost, chasing away the chill of death. And they tell stories. Stories, paradoxically, of death, spirits returned from the grave, Revenants from beyond, delivering divine revelations. Ghostly revenges visited on the guilty living. Restless ghouls compelled to forever reenact their tortured demise. Whence comes this fascination? Join me and we will explore this tradition. Join me if you can withstand the chill. Join me as we consider Christmas ghosts. Hey guys, Bartell's Bookshelf here, and uh, as the intro um, explained, today, for the Christmas season, we're going to be talking about this collection of ghost stories, Christmas Ghosts, edited by Catherine Kramer and David G. Hartwell. Um, I thought it would be fun uh, to read through this book and then um, make a video sort of going into each story in detail, talking a little bit about the authors and uh, the stories. This is uh, 17 great ghost stories in the Christmas tradition, as it says. This specific edition is a Dell paperback from 1988, but it, this was originally published in hardcover in 1987. Uh, David G. Hartwell, of course, was an, uh, an incredibly influential editor um, for both science fiction and horror. He edited things like um, The uh, Foundations of Fear, um, uh, The Dark Descent, and in regards to science fiction and, and fantasy, edited things like The Space Opera Renaissance and uh, several other uh, anthologies, uh, standalone anthologies, with his wife, Catherine Kramer, such as uh, Masterpieces of Fantasy and Enchantment. And there's also something of a follow-up to this collection called um, Spirits of Christmas, which was also edited by his wife. Unfortunately, um, David G. Hartwell passed in 2016 after a, a terrible accident, um, so rest in peace to him. Um, but yes, he was a very, very influential editor. And um, the stories in this book are mostly from the 19th century, early 20th century. It's, it's uh, for something that was published in the 80s. It's very old fashioned. There's only one or two stories in here that actually come from the 70s and 80s. Um, and the rest are, are much, much older than that. But, but, I, but I like that. It gives it a sort of um, very old fashioned, you know, Christmas ghosts type of feeling. So yeah, let's just get into it. The first story in the collection is Their Dear Little Ghost by Elia Wilkinson Patey, uh, published in 1898. Um, I thought this was a really good uh, start to the collection. Um, it's, uh, it's about a, um, a, a, a good little girl who dies and returns as a ghost on Christmas. Um, it's very uh, elegiac, very morose and melancholy, um, and it's narrated uh, from the perspective of an old woman who's looking back on her life and telling a story. So it, it, it has the, it kind of perfectly sets you up for this, um, you know, let's gather around the campfire and tell a spooky tale type of thing. Patey, uh, she was an American journalist and author. Uh, she wrote over 800 columns, apparently, for the Omaha World Herald and eventually became its chief editorial writer. She also became the literary editor for the Chicago Tribune. And um, for the time, she was a very political woman. Um, she opposed capital punishment, lynching, and the Wounded Knee Massacre, and she also wrote travelogues such as A Trip Through Wonderland, which was published in 1889. She, she seems like a very interesting, um, um, very uh, pa very strong woman, um, someone I'll have to maybe look into in the future. Um, yeah, I thought this was a good start. I thought it was, you know, atmospheric and interesting, and she seemed like an interesting person. So yeah, uh, that was a fun start one. Very short, only about six pages. The second story is The Curse of the Catafalques by F. Anstey from 1882. This story uh, is about, uh, it's really funny, it's a, it's a very typical, you know, dry British humor of that time period, um, about uh, this uh, sort of a con artist who decides to um, 
wiggle his way into the into the company of this uh, rich family, the catafalques, so that he can uh, marry their daughter and you know inherit their fortune. But the catafalques are all very morose and kind of um, on edge and uh, constantly going on about having you know there being a curse on the family and uh, having to, and, and about how in order for him to marry into the family he has to undergo this mysterious rite, um, which uh, involves him meeting this uh, this. Uh, spooky creature that we never really learn about in detail. Um, yeah, this is very different from the first story in that uh, it's very comedic, very dry. It felt surprisingly modern in the way that it plays with kind of no, uh, tropes of sort of like gothic literature and things like that in that, you know, you have, you know, the mysterious uh, isolated family with a dark secret, um, you know, intimations of the supernatural. Uh, and a lot of the uh, humor arises uh, out of the story in how, um, the narrator is almost kind of blissfully unaware of how obvious there is that something weird is going on. You know, everyone's sort of like, uh, you know, um, ir irritable and on edge and morose and, and sad and like always going, you know, going on about, you know, their curse and things and um, making references to um, these, uh, you know, these mysterious rites and rituals and, and, and uh, creatures that he may have to encounter. And um, he interprets it all as, um, oh, the father must be uh, setting something up, you know, looking into my background to make sure I'm legit, you know, just completely oblivious to the fact that there's anything weird going on. It's almost as if uh, some, you know, average person was kind of plopped into the middle of a gothic novel without knowing anything about it and kind of just being very um, ignorant and oblivious of everything. And that made the story really entertaining and funny. Um, and I also liked that uh, the supernatural elements are not explicitly described the the narrator runs away before uh, actually seeing anything um <laughs> and it's, just, it's just really funny how he's like you know if somebody else wants to go back and 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 try you know getting in with the family they're welcome to you know um I, so yeah i really enjoyed this story i'd never heard of f anstey his real name was thomas anstey guthrie he was a british novelist primarily a comic novelist known for his book vice versa published in 1882 which is sort of a topsy-turvy novel where a son take um takes his father's place, you know, they switch places in their lives, you know, where his father become, you know, goes to his son's uh, university and things like that. I haven't heard of that before, but apparently it was very, very popular at the time. He was also uh, well known for his contributions to Punch magazine, which may be one of the most influential humor magazines in the West. He also wrote a book entitled The Tinted Venus, which was adapted into a musical in the 40s by uh, S.J. Perelman, Ogden Nash, and Kurt Vile. Kurt Vile is one of my favorite composers. I love his stuff, so that was cool to hear about. And then that was adapted into a film entitled One Touch of Venus in 1948. So I'll have to look more into him. He sounds really interesting. And I'll have to look into the film as well, see what that's like. Another another enjoyable one. Um, it's, it's, it's nice to sort of balance the, the sadness with humor, and uh, you'll be seeing a lot of that in this collection as we continue. The third story is by a very famous author, one of the most famous authors in the world, Charles Dickens, of course. How can you have a Christmas Ghosts collection without Charles Dickens? But of course, rather than focusing on sort of the obvious ones of, you know, Christmas Carol and the chimes and things like that. This is actually one of his earliest, I believe, uh, Christmas stories. This is uh, The Story of the Goblins Who Stole a Sexton from 1836. This is a really imaginative and fun Christmas romp um, involving a sexton, who's basically an old term for a grave digger, um, who's very, you know, bah humbug, clearly, you know, an early uh, antecedent to, uh, to um, Scrooge. And, uh, he goes out on Christmas Eve to dig a grave because he's just pissed at everybody, you know, being so happy and cheerful all the time. And so um, while uh, digging this grave, he runs into a bunch of goblins who decide to punish him for his uh, for, you know, not keeping the Christmas spirit. And they take him down to uh, their underworld and they subject him to various tortures and um, show him all of these, you know, sort of like uh, almost like projections, like like films. But, you know, this is before film, obviously, um, you know, visions of, um, you know, Christmas cheer and things essentially. um which essentially, you know, force him to repent and 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 keep Christmas in his heart, you know, essentially uh, abusing and torturing a man into having Christmas spirit. Um, the goblins are a lot of fun. They're they're you know very like mis mischievous and very witty and always kind of like uh, you know pointing these you know you know barbs at, at the sexton. Uh, the main goblin, you know, has like this long tongue, and he's described as wearing a, a, a sugar loaf hat. I'll put a, an illustration up here so you can see what what he looks like and. Um, you know, as somebody who's, you know, a bit of a degenerate, uh, it was also very lootable, you know, this older man being taken by these twinky goblins and uh, tortured. I don't know, you could read some stuff into that if you wanted to. <laughs> Obviously, there's nothing I, I, I need to say about Charles Dickens. The whole world knows who he is. And everybody knows about Christmas Carol. But this is a really interesting one. I'd never read it before. And it was it was a lot of fun. And I looked more into it. This is actually originally published as part of his first novel, The Pickwick Papers 
which um, was more uh, episodic in nature than a lot of his other novels, almost like a collection of uh, interconnected short stories. And this is one of the stories in that collection. Um, and it's interesting, you can sort of see the, uh, the antecedents to um, A Christmas Carol in this story. And that made it very interesting, as well as just being very fun and very imaginative and British, you know, very, very British humor. Um, I just loved the the sort of matter of fact nature of the supernatural. You know, it's not like um, Scrooge in Christmas Carol, where, you know, he's immediately trying to sort of brush off um, all the ghosts and the supernatural happenings. You know, there's more gravy than grave about you. There isn't any of that in this story. The, the supernatural is pre presented very matter of factly. And I liked that. I thought that was interesting. It gives it kind of a fairy tale vibe in a way. This also was apparently adapted uh, into an animation from 1987 called Charles Dickens's Ghost Stories. I haven't had a chance to watch that, that yet, but um, I will look into it. And I'm sure if it's anything like the story, it'll be pretty fun. In my research for the story, I find a lot of fun art, including um, this one, which I really enjoyed. And this is actually, I found out, this is drawn by uh, Blue Worm, a.k.a. the lone animator, who's a, a Swedish guy who um, does all these amazing stop-motion adaptations of things like uh, Robert E. Howard, Lovecraft, other weird writers. Um, and he's very interested in you know folklore and things like that. So this is really cool, and I'll definitely uh, link to his channel in the description. I highly recommend checking out his stuff. He's a great, great artist, and he needs more uh, support. He, he's not very well known, unfortunately. The fourth story is called Christmas Night. This is the first uh, sort of modern story uh, by Elizabeth Walter, published in 1975. This one was okay. Um, in contrast to the other stories, which, which felt old-fashioned, you know, they were very clearly of their time. This one felt old-fashioned in a bad way. It was a little stilted and remote, um, but it was a fun idea, and, and it had a cool twist. It's basically about um, this couple who goes to stay in this uh, old um, bed and breakfast after their car kind of breaks down. There's all this fog, and they're trying to you know get somewhere, so they decide to spend the night in this uh, hotel, and the proprietor is really weird and creepy, but they decide to go to bed, and in the middle of the night, um, the boyfriend uh, is woken up by uh, the proprietor of the hotel or the bed and breakfast kind of looking in on them, you know, mysteriously, but he's distracted by another car pulling up and he goes back to sleep. And the next morning he finds out that the, the guest who pulled up in the other car was mysteriously killed. And um, the uh, bed and breakfast that they, they tell the cops, you know, was, uh, you know, where they stayed, it's completely gone. It's disappeared. That was a fun little uh, creepy bit of suspense with an interesting twist. Um, I won't give all the full details. You can read the story for yourself. Um, but yeah, it was interesting. I didn't like it as much as the other stories. As I said, it felt a little bit... I, I actually was surprised to find out when I looked up that it was from 1975. It felt very old-fashioned in the way that it was written, but not necessarily in a good way. As I mentioned, it was a little bit stilted, a little bit remote, kind of um, didn't quite have that, that frisson of terror that you would want in a story like this, but it was interesting. Uh, Elizabeth Walter was a British author. Um, she was an editor for the British, British publisher Collins uh, for their Crime Club imprint, for more than 30 years, um, and that was kind of her main calling. She was primarily a crime novelist, and apparently uh, she had a bunch of stories that were adapted for a 70s anthology show, Circle of Fear, uh, stories such as The New House, The Concrete Captain, Pendergast, and Traveling Companion, and uh, her story, uh, The Spider, was adapted for Rod Serling's Night Gallery, so she seems to be another one of those kind of uh, quiet, austere British authors who primarily made their living um, in other... other uh, they made their living in, in other uh, literary pursuits, but um, as writers, they're known for the, you know, very uh, small, you know, cycles of, you know, thrillers and short sto thrilling short stories and supernatural tales of the supernatural and things like that. And there's a lot of writers like that in this collection, which I thought was interesting. I might check out some of her stuff if I can find a, an anthology here or there. Um, but the story wasn't my favorite of this collection so far. Next, we have uh, A New Christmas Carol by Arthur Mackin, very famous author. This is uh, published in 1920. There isn't much to say about this story because uh, it's very short. Um, it's a sort of a sh short satirical bit of nastiness, which is uh, sort of a, a riff on um, A Christmas Carol, obviously, which takes place 10 years after the original story, where the ghosts come back to, to, to visit uh, Scrooge. And they show him, um, you know, the modern era of 1920, you know, when the story was written. He's visited by the Christmas spirit of 1920. And Scrooge is horrified by how um, all of the things that he was sort of uh, warned against uh, in the original story have kind of uh, increased, you know, a hundredfold. Um, you know, greed and capitalism and all that stuff. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a fun sort of little uh, 
satirical sort of piece, but it's very short. There's not much to, to mention about it. It's entertaining enough, you know, an ent entertaining little riff on the story. It's not really a story. It's more of a sketch or sort of a polemic, you know, a political piece. It, it smacked a little bit of, you know, like kids these days, you know, of like, of like an old man yelling at clouds, you know, which is ironic considering it was published in 1920. But Arthur Mackin was kind of known for that, at least from what I understand. I'm not an Arthur Mackin expert. I haven't read a lot of his stuff. But I know he's he's very a very devoted fan base and a very important um, author in the weird fiction genre. You know, I'm publishing things like uh, the Three Imposters, uh, the Great God Pan, m many many influential uh, supernatural horror and weird stories. But from what I know about him, apparently he was quite old fashioned and he was very religious. I believe too, he was very stringent in his beliefs. So it it, it kind of feels a little bit like that. Um, but it was interesting. Uh, the story was originally published in the London Evening News, December 28th, 1920, and it was later collected in The Glorious Mystery, which is uh, mostly essays. But then it was also uh, was recollected in the more fiction-focused uh, collection, The Cozy Room and Other Stories. Um, so, interesting. Um, not, I don't, I don't think it really serves well as an introduction to Arthur Mackin, but, you know, interesting enough. The next story is A Christmas Game by A.N. L. Munby, published in 1949. Um, this was a really fun one about a, uh, a, a an old a mysterious old man who comes to stay with a, with a family over Christmas and they play that game you know where uh, you turn all the lights off and you have people reach into bowls of spaghetti and things like that and you say this is their guts you know you have a bowl of peeled grapes and you say this is their eyeballs but when uh, the old man reaches out and feels the eyeballs he's horrified by them and he tosses them into the fire and the narrator who is uh, narrating as an adult from the perspective of you know when he was a child at the time, discovers that somehow the uh, the grapes became real eyes in, in the fire. And later that night, when he goes to sleep, he's awoken by uh, the mysterious ghost of a, a Maori warrior who has come to seek revenge and to find his lost eyes. So yeah, this is a really, really fun, a surprisingly vicious little bit of um, ghostly revenge. Um, I really enjoyed the fact that the ghost was sort of a native uh, Maori man. Um, it's a very unusual sort of uh, guise for, for a ghost to appear in, especially in sort of the English ghost story of the time. Um, and it kind of touches on, you know, the horrors of colonialism and, you know, the violence that was visited on uh, native peoples, which is uh, fairly progressive for the time. And of course, you know, I, I always love ghost stories that involve the ghost searching for something lost, you know, something that was taken from them. There's that famous story of the ghost in the big, with the big toe. There's uh, that uh, subplot in um, The Haunting of Hill House, the TV show, about the tall man trying to get his hat, hat back. For some reason, that just really appeals to me. There's something primal and, uh, and, and almost fairy tale esque about it, you know, this beast that doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily here to cause violence, but merely is coming back to, to, to reclaim what was theirs. I, I, I love stuff like that. A.N.L. Munby, uh, his, his full name is Alan Noel Latimer Munby. He was a POW during World War II, so I imagine a lot of the uh, writing about, you know, sort of uh, the horrors of war were written from experience. Um, but he was mostly known as a scholar and a librarian, similar to um, M.R. James, actually. Um, he became the librarian of King's College, and he was eventually elected as a fellow. In terms of a uh, scholarly study, he was best known uh, for a study of the uh, famous book collector Sir Thomas Phillips. Um, but in the in the in the realm of sort of weird supernatural tales, he was known for a book of uh, ghost stories, The Alabaster Hand, which this story is taken from. And uh, this collection was praised at the time by Anthony Boucher and Jesse McComas. Anthony Boucher, in particular, was a very influential editor at the time. Um, he was uh, the creator, co-creator with. Um, Jesse McComas, of uh, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, which became one of the, the premier fantasy magazines of the time, and is still in print today, still being published uh, today. Uh, and he was an accomplished author in his own right. He wrote stories like The Complete Werewolf, so he's a, two, ve two very influential people. And he, and he praised, um, him and Jesse McComas praised uh, The Alabaster Hand as quietly terrifying modernizations of the M.R. James tradition, and I can, you can definitely feel that in this story. So I will definitely have to see if I can track down a copy of that and read the rest of these stories, because I really enjoyed this one. It was so dark and atmospheric, and yeah, I really enjoyed that. The next story is The Great Staircase at Landover Hall by Frank R. Stockton, originally published in 1900. This one did, wasn't my favorite. Again, it's an interesting idea. It's about a man who, um, on Christmas uh, Eve one night, um, when the clock strikes midnight, this mysterious, uh, beautiful woman appears on the staircase, and uh, he instantly falls in love with her, but realizes that he can't be with her because she's the ghost of a woman who died years and years and years ago. Uh, but then he later discovers that uh, she has a descendant who looks very much like her. This was, Again, this was an interesting idea. The pacing of the story hurts its emotional impact. Obviously, it's about a 10, 15-page short story, 
And um, so he, uh, the author is trying to compress all of these things into, into a very short amount of time, trying to get across this, you know, sort of um, tragic romance, you know, a woman who can't be, who's, who, who's, who your, feeling, your feelings for this woman can't be fully um, explored because she's a ghost, you know, it's an interesting idea, but it's such a short story that there's no real time to develop it. The romance feels rushed. Um, the ending feels rushed as a result, you know, like it all, it all makes sense logically where it goes. It just didn't quite have that, that emotional oomph for me. Um, but again, it was an interesting idea, just not my favorite. But I was uh, interested when I looked up Frank R. Stockton. Uh, he was primarily a humorist author, like a lot of the authors in this collection are. But he's best known for the short story, The Lady or the Tiger from 1882, which is like one of the most studied short stories in history. I mean, every English textbook must have a copy of it, I'm pretty sure. Uh, very famous story. Uh, known for its sort of ambiguity and its uh, sort of philosophical um, questions that it that it raises, which really surprised me um, because uh, that's a very well-known short story and he's a very well-known writer, but I didn't really vibe with this one. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. I haven't read any of his other stuff, but he wrote, uh, aside from that, that, that's kind of his main claim to fame, but I found that he also wrote a large amount of children's fairy tales um, and as well as a, an adventure novel, um, the Adventures of Captain Horn from 1895, which apparently was the third best-selling novel of that year. So at one one time, he was a very, very popular writer. So um, again, I, I, I learned a lot about him. I, would, I, I need to look more into him, uh, maybe read that uh, that book, you know, see how that is. But um, as, as for um, this story, didn't really do it for me. Not my favorite. Felt a little schmaltzy, a little rushed. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, Christmas ghosts, it's the Christmas season. I don't mind a bit of schmaltz. You know, a Christmas carol is a little schmaltzy, some might say. But I think what makes a Christmas carol work and what makes you ultimately accept the schmaltz is that to get there, to get to all the schmaltz, you have to go through this harrowing story of horror and death and greed and loneliness and misery, you know. And so it feels a little bit more earned in that respect. This just felt a little corny, in my opinion, but interesting. The next story is The Water Ghost of Harrowby Hall by John Kendrick Bangs, published in 1891. Again, another uh, humorist uh, story um, written by a primarily humorist author. For some reason, I guess, something about the Christmas season and ghosts, you know, it, it invites a lot of humor. I'm not sure why, but um, this was a, a, a funny, you know, very goofy tale. It's not scary at all, but it was very, very light, very dry sense of humor. It's basically about this... this uh, this house that's haunted by a, you know, a, a water ghost, you know, the ghost of a woman who was drowned in a lake. And um, every uh, Christmas, uh, she comes and, like, torments the family. Um, and uh, every, uh, over the years, like, people are getting just more and more frustrated by it and um, sort of uh, very perturbed until um, the main character, the narrator, he decides to um, overcome the ghost in a very um, unique way. And that was one of the things I really liked about the story. I, I really enjoyed how um, he, uh, he outsmarted the ghost. And, and as, I, as I sort of alluded to a minute ago, I, I really enjoyed sort of the very unperturbed nature of, uh, of, the, of the narrators in the story. It's, it's very much in contrast to the narrator of um, Curse of the Catafalques, who is very easily frightened by the supernatural events and uh, is so scared of them even that he runs away before we even see any of the any ghosts or supernatural creatures in the story but in this you know you kind of get the sense that you know they've been haunted by this ghost for so long that it's sort of like a, almost like a minor inconvenience you know some like a year a yearly thing that you kind of have to go through um so the narrator he's very like unperturbed and very like oh like you know like listen here you know i'm, I'm tired of this and i'm gonna take care of you you know i, I really liked that that was a lot of fun john kendrick bangs he was an american author known mostly for satirical humorous writing um, including books such as Mr. Munchausen from 1901. Uh, he also um, created um, uh, his, his, an, an entire uh, style of fantasy storytelling known as Bangsian fantasy, which features historical characters in an afterlife setting uh, interacting with each other. Uh, you can see the influence on, on that in stuff like Philip Jose Farmer's Riverworld series or Richard Matheson's What Dreams May Come, you know, characters who end up in some sort of mysterious afterlife and interact with historical figures. He kind of invented that style of fantasy. Um, but aside from uh, his, his uh, writing achievements, um, he had many other literary achievements. Uh, he, was an, he was an accomplished editor. Uh, he had stints at magazines like Life, Harper's Magazine, Harper's Bazaar. And uh, in 1904, he became the editor of the American humor magazine Puck, which uh, in a lot of ways is kind of the, uh, the American version of Punch Magazine, a very, very seminal uh, American humor magazine. So uh, again, another author that was very, very popular in his day and that maybe not a lot of people um, read anymore. 
But this story was a lot of fun, and seeing how influential he was on later works of science fiction and fantasy, I really need to check out some of his stuff. So if you know if any of you know where to start with that, let me know. I really enjoyed the this story. The next story is A Christmas Meeting by Rosemary Timperley, published in 1952. Again, a slightly more modern one. This is another one that's in incredibly short. It's about four pages, and uh, it's about an old woman who has an experience with, with, with a young man who appears to be a ghost, but... Uh, through uh, some of the some of the uh, reveals in the story, it plays with a uh, time and sort of temporal weirdness and uh, sort of questioning who really who is a ghost. Um, perhaps ghosts are thing are not only spirits of the de from the past that we that we see. Perhaps they could be spirits from the future. A very interesting idea. Um, well, you know, the twist maybe doesn't hit as hard as it would have in 1952. It's definitely a very interesting concept, and this story actually was very very popular. Um, it's been anthologized over and over again, including um, Roald Dahl's uh, Book of Ghost Stories and several other sort of ghost story collections. So it's, it's, it, this is the type of story that you would expect to see in a collection like this. As you can probably tell, you know, she was a British author, mostly known for her ghost stories, and a lot of them have been widely anthologized, including this one. Again, sort of part of that, that, that sort of British school of, you know, authors who, you know, sort of quietly, you know, pumped out these uh, spooky stories that... Um, were maybe not uh, super well known at the time, but became very heavily anthologized and very well respected. You know, um, not necessarily on the level of you know maybe somebody like H.P. Lovecraft, but you know, you know that that school of sort of quiet, mysterious, you know, unnerving British authors. You know, the, the, that that sort of uh, continued in the tradition of authors like uh, M.R. James and people like that. One one other interesting thing that I also found out about her is that she was incredibly prolific. She wrote sixty six novels in thirty three years and edited five of Barry and Rockcliffe's ghost books uh, anthologies, which were uh, eventually reprinted by Pan Books. So those were very popular in the UK, and some of the UK viewers might have uh, read or seen some of those. So yeah, very interesting. Um, I, I, I didn't necessarily love this story, but I liked the concept of it, and I thought it was written well. So I will definitely, again, look into more of her stories. The next story is The Ghost by William D. O'Connor from 1856. Uh, this is a, more of a novella than a short story. Very clearly inspired by A Christmas Carol, but it was interesting. It's about a, an older man who, you know, like Scrooge, is very miserly and, you know, very, very, very unforgiving. He refuses to forgive uh, uh, this, this older woman uh, for being delinquent on her rent, um, even though she has, you know, a sick child and stuff like that. But he's, uh, he's visited um, by the ghost of an old friend of his who was a very young, beautiful, handsome man. He was, he was, a, he was a poet. He had very uh, romantic ideas. He believed in, you know, the goodwill of people and helping others who couldn't help themselves, you know, helping the less fortunate, you know, all that kind of stuff. Unlike uh, A Christmas Carol, the ghost never interacts with him directly. He's sort of on the fringes of the narrator, kind of uh, subtly influencing him by uh, bringing attention uh, an old letter that he wrote to him that sort of uh, helps um, give the give the, uh, the the main character his change of heart again. Very very clearly inspired by a Christmas Carol. This only came what about twelve thir thirteen years after a Christmas Carol, but it's a little bit subtler. Um, it's not quite as uh, over the top as um, Dickens, and it's a, it's a little bit more intimate. Um, where um, the ghosts are the ghost in the story, as I mentioned, is directly related to um, the main character. It's interesting because uh, the, the the ghost is again uh, an old friend, a very old friend who who died young. But they uh, intimate that they were very very close. I, I I thought it would be interesting to read some homoerotic elements into their relationship. That you certainly could interpret it that way. Um, it's a it was a clearly a very passionate friendship. When uh, they they mention that when uh, the friend was dying of fever, the only person that he he asked for was the 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 main character of the story. Um, he asked for him, and he and he stayed with him by his bedside while he he was delirious with fever. It's interesting how it, the the love of his old friend uh, almost uh, compels him to to remember who he was when he was when he was younger, and to um remember that idealistic person that he was. And the story also mentions how uh, the 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 main character is very cold and very almost uh, estranged with his wife. They live in the same house, but um, try to spend as little amount of time together as possible. So again. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not saying that. You know, it's my interpretation of the story. I think it's interesting to read it that way, and it makes it a much more uh, impactful story, in my opinion. Uh, and then I looked into the author, and I was interested to find he was an American author, mostly known for his close friendships with other authors, including Walt Whitman. And he and Walt Whitman actually lived together for several months. Don't know. 
makes you think. <laughs> um, but another interesting thing about him was that he was actually an early proponent of the Shakespeare authorship question, you know, the conspiracy that Shakespeare never actually wrote his plays. There was the theory that um, Francis Bacon was the author, Christopher Marlowe, a bunch of other contemporaries. It's largely discredited by uh, scholars, uh, by modern scholars, but it's interesting. It's interesting, and um, he uh, he wrote about it while working for um, the Saturday Evening Post, and he defended other supporters of the of the theory, like uh, Delia Bacon, who was one of the more prominent um, um, believers in the in the in the theory. And he he also seemed uh, quite progressive for his time. Uh, he published an anti slavery novel in uh, 1860 called Harrington, a story of true love, which I couldn't find a whole lot of information about. But it's again, it's pretty interesting. He seemed like a very progressive person for the time, and you know. Friends, friends with Walt Whitman, you never know. So yeah, that was that was an interesting story. It was very uh, obviously. I said you know, as I mentioned, it was very clearly influenced by A Christmas Carol. But I felt like it, it forged its own path, you know, with a, with a very moving, sort of intimate story of you know male friendship. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed that one. The next story was A Christmas Reunion by Sir Andrew Caldecott, published in 1946. Again, another uh, very dryly humorous story. There's a lot of that in this collection. Um, but this has a little bit more of a spookier bent than some of the other humorous stories. It's basically about, um, uh, again, similar to the um, A. N. L. Munby story. Uh, it's about a, a man visiting another family over Christmas who seems to have a mysterious past, and they're visited by a, a Santa who, you know, um, back in the day, you know, you could hire um, a Santa, you know, Santa from like a department store who would go around and like go to people's houses and like you know give presents and letters and Christmas cards and things. But this Santa is. A little bit weird, and it gives uh, he gives uh, the mysterious man a letter that really really spooks him, and then later the mysterious man uh, is visited uh, a horrible death. Interesting, and uh, it's implied that uh, Christmas spirits came to visit revenge upon him. So yeah, I really enjoyed that. It, it, it was it was a little it was it was it was funny. You know, it had um, again that very dry British humor. You know, that very um sort of sarcastic um sort of like oh yes, you know this type of humor. And uh, it's obviously very very indebted to M. R. James. You know, with uh, a mysterious artifact. You know, uh, linking someone to 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 the past and uh, uh, violence. You know, from the past being visited on them in the few in the present and things like that. One thing that I I, I felt I, I did feel it took that the allusions to M. R. James a little too far, in that at the end of the story. The narrator actually pulls out a copy of M. R. James's um, one of M. R. James's books, and he quotes from it, and it essentially kind of explains <laughs> the modus operandi of the story and how the ghost worked and what the ghost did. That felt a little bit on the nose for me, but other than that, it was a pretty enjoyable, creepy little story. But then I was very interested to look into the author, Sir Andrew Caldecott. I was like, why is he a sir? Um, so he was primarily a colonial politician. Uh, he was uh, the 28th governor of Ceylon and the 19th governor of Hong Kong. He had the shortest uh, tenure in the history of Hong Kong, of colonial Hong Kong. From He was only in office from December 1935 to April 1937. But uh, from what I gathered in you know my my brief research, I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not a, a historical scholar. I don't know much about you know military and government and that type of thing. But it seems like he was pretty well liked by everybody. But uh, after his political career, that was when he got into fiction writing. So it's kind of interesting. He became he, he didn't become an author till toward the end of his his life. Really, um, this story was published in 1946, and he died in 1951. So he's a very very late late to the game of uh, authorship, but he published uh, two collections of supernatural fiction, Not Exactly Ghosts, uh, which this uh, story is from, and Fires Burn Blue, 1947 and, and 1948, respectively. So uh, again, uh, very much in the M.R. James tradition, seems very interesting, a uh, very interesting um, backstory for a, for a supernatural fiction author to have, so I'll definitely have to look more into him. The next story is The Ghosts at Grantley by Leonard Kipp from 1878. Yet another light and humorous story. Not scary at all, but it's very sweet and romantic, you know, with a little hint of sarcasm. Um, this is a, a, a little similar to uh, the John Kendrick Bangs story in that it deals with a yearly haunting of ghosts at this uh, big manor house. Every uh, Christmas, when the bells ring, these two ghosts come to come, you know, um, materialize. And they're the ghosts of two brothers who seem to have been visited a violent end. And they, they seem to have issues with each other. They're they're very um, irritable and don't like don't like to talk about uh, one or the other. But they're 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 from a different time. They're they're from around the 1600s. They're described as having you know the puffy the puffy uh, tunics and things like that, and the and the the rapier swords and things. Uh, again, I I I liked the the atmosphere of the story. It's very it's very uh, 
unperturbed. The, the narrators and such are very, are very unperturbed. In fact, um, the narrator uh, discovers what's going on at this house when he finds um, the, the sort of uh, the, 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 patern, the, the father of the house um, <laughs> throwing books at the ghosts uh, because he's just so incensed by them and so annoyed by you know, how rude they are to intrude on his property that he, he, he's constantly throwing things at them and you know, they disappear. And this is also interesting in that um, the ghosts themselves are also very unperturbed by everything. And they don't really kind of act like, um, you know, ghosts, re uh, you know, visiting back from the grave would, you know, they're not moaning or making spooky noises. They're always, they, in fact, they, 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 they seem not to realize that they're dead. They're very um, angry at uh, the other people in the in the house where the, the, they, they act like they're intruding on their property. You know, they're always kind of like, what are you doing here? Why are you in my study? You know, like, this is my house. Why are you in my bedroom? And I really loved, uh, again, it, it just really hits with me, that dry British humor. It's just something I really vibe with. The narrator, or the main character in this story, he's, he's a young uh, aspiring lawyer who's trying to court um, the, 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 the daughter of the house. And um, the, he's very, they're very like sort of dry and very... Um, arch about everything. There's a scene where he and uh, the daughter are talking in the library and uh, they talk about getting uh, engaged to each other as if it's sort of a business transaction, kind of trying not to allude too much to how strong their feelings are for each other. And they're trying to kind of like couch it, you know, as if it's like a benefit for each other, you know, like, oh, it only makes sense. You know, it'll, you, know you, you can help us like figure out these ghosts better and things like that. Um, I really enjoyed that. And um, there's the central mystery revolving around a jewel that um, one of the brothers accuses the other of having stolen. Um, it's like this really important sacred family jewel. And uh, the central mystery of that was fun too, what ended up happening to the jewel. I won't spoil that if you want to read the story. But yeah, so this is a really entertaining one. I really liked it. Uh, it's interesting that this story has a very kind of British sort of feeling to it because uh, the author was a New Yorker. He was part of, you know, old New York. Um, uh, Leonard Kipp, he was from Albany. And um, he's mostly known for being part of the California Gold Rush. Uh, he went to the West Coast in 1849. He spent some time in the gold mines there. And then he returned to Albany and wrote uh, uh, several books and articles about his experiences, including um, a travelogue called uh, California Sketches in 1850. Um, and he wrote a, a few other travelogues after that. But he also see, uh, wrote a few um, sort of fun little uh, ghost stories or supernatural stories. So it was, again, it was very interesting. It's, I always find it's, it's very interesting how a lot of these uh, writers had such varied career paths before landing on you know stories and fiction writing and stuff it's, it's very interesting so yeah that was that was a fun one i enjoyed that a lot the next story is the christmas banquet by, by nathaniel hawthorne published in 1843 um nathaniel hawthorne again isn't a classic author that i have a lot of experience with but but based on this story i really really enjoyed it this is sort of a, a very uh, somber sketch of uh this uh yearly christmas tradition where this old benefactor who was very very rich at the time of his death, he put a, uh, a stipulation in his will saying that um, on every Christmas Eve, they're to invite uh, a bunch of people over for a banquet, the, the most miserable people on the on earth, you know, who have been, you know, put put upon, you know, who've just been kicked while they're down, you know, whether they've uh, been through heartbreak, trauma, whether they've been in poverty, just... Um, you know, just kind of all of the, the miserable sort of sad sacks of the world. They all come together for this banquet, and at the head of the table is the, the withered skeletal remains of the, uh, the benefactor who is kind of sitting there eating with them, you know, spending the, the, the banquet with them. It's, it's, very, it's a very creepy, gothic uh, image. Throughout the story, this same young man keeps appearing at every banquet, and they always ask him about, um, you know, like, why are you here? You know, um, you, you don't belong here. You haven't, you haven't experienced hardship like we have. Um, and, and it's intimated that he himself is a very successful businessman. He's a, he has a wife and kids. And as the years go by, he keeps showing up to these banquets. He, he gets older and older. He becomes kind of a fixture at them. And uh, but people keep wondering, like, what are you doing here? What could have possibly happened to you? You know, like, there's no way you've been through as much trauma as us. Finally, uh, at the end of the story, he reveals that his trauma isn't necessarily something that is um, some big melodramatic thing. It's that despite everything that's happened to him in his life, Despite all of the uh, successes and the, and the experiences that he's had, he feels nothing. Uh, he, he, he goes through life almost kind of pretending to be human. And that is where his sort of melancholy arises from. Um, not, not being able to experience life in the way that so many other people can um, to, to really relish uh, emotion and all of its ups and downs. This was really interesting. It's not really a ghost story. It's more of a it's more of a gothic fairy tale, but it has this beautifully dark atmosphere, as I mentioned, you know, with the imagery of the, uh, the skeleton sitting at the head of the table and this oppressive 
morose atmosphere of, of, of misery as all these people, you know, dine, you know, and then deal with their various various problems. It's it's almost like a gothic fairy tale. And I liked that the, the ghostly activity was more intimated, you know, implied. Um, there wasn't really any overt spookiness. And it also had a very interesting theme of, you know, a life unlived, you know, uh, a life unlived is no life at all. And um, in the way that it touched on uh, the mysterious man's um, flat emotional affect and sort of unfeeling nature, it's almost like an early study of a psychopath. And, and it's interesting because, again, I, I'd never read Hawthorne before. Um, of course, I knew about, you know, the Scarlet Letter and his relationships with other writers like Herman Melville and Edgar Allan Poe, but I had no idea he was so dark and gothic, and, and I loved the atmosphere in this story. This was first published in the United States Magazine and Democratic Review in December 1843, and it was later collected in his short story uh, collection, Mosses from an Old Manse in 1846. I had no idea. I had no idea Nathaniel Hawthorne was uh, so dark and gothic, but as I said, I looked into it, and yeah, he had relationships with uh, writers like Edgar Allan Poe. I think him and Edgar Allan Poe actually kind of um, inspired each other quite a lot, so I thought that was really, really interesting, So, and I was like, man, like, I love this kind of stuff. I love gothic fiction. I've talked about it before, and, and I, how have I not read Nathaniel Hawthorne? So I'm definitely going to do more of that in the new year. I need to read more Nathaniel Hawthorne. I, based on this story, I, I loved it. I, it was a really, really good story. Probably one of my favorites in the, in the whole collection so far. And the next story was very good too. Um, the Crown Derby Plate by Marjorie Bowen, published in 1933. Um, this is this was just, you know, th this wasn't, this isn't like the Nathaniel Hawthorne story in that it's not really um, trying to discuss any deeper themes or anything like that or make any broad statements about, you know, society or whatever. It's just a very, very good, a very excellent classical Christmas ghost story about this older woman who's an antique collector, and she's uh, she has this um, this huge collection of of, uh, of plates of china plates that she bought years and years and years ago. But there's this one plate that's always been missing, and she finds out that uh, this old woman in this uh, abandoned old manor house has it has has the plate that she's missing, the plate that she needs to complete her collection. So she goes there. And she interacts with this woman, and she's very strange and morose and smells kind of mildewy. She says all of these, like, cryptic things about how she, she spends all of her time sleeping outside in the garden. And uh, you can probably see where, the, where the, this is going. Uh, the twist is very obvious. This mysterious woman turns out to be the ghost of someone who died there and was buried in the garden and is very uh, protective of her, uh, her china. So again, it, it's, it's, not, it's, not the most, it's, not, it's not the most amazing, unexpected plot. But I've always said before that tropes executed well can be sublime, and this was just really well done. The atmosphere is spooky and oppressive. Just the way that she describes the the, the, the old like mildewed house, the wet walls, and just, and just the gray kind of oppressive, just sickliness of everything, and and the way that she describes the uh, the central ghost, you know, the the, the mildewy smell arising from it. Um, again, you know, that sort of like wet kind of earthy loamy vibe. Um, the the weird creepy mysterious it's kind of like non sequiturs that the ghost is always like referring to and how uh at the end of the story how, how um the the woman uh, the narrator of the story slowly pieces together all of these elements to realize what she's just witnessed it was really really well done i really liked it so when i looked more into the author i found out her real name was uh, margaret gabriella vare campbell she was a British author who wrote tons of stories of all, all types, all kinds of stories, but she's mostly known for her historical fiction and her supernatural stories. Her first novel is The Viper of Milan, published in 1906. It was written when she was 16 years old and apparently led to a scandal over a woman having written something so violent and inappropriate. I didn't uh, look super deep into the novel, so I don't know exactly what about it was considered objectionable at the time, but uh, I think, you know, you know how it is back then when women wrote anything that was vaguely untoward, it was like, oh, how could a female do such a thing? So, but the novel was incredibly successful and kickstarted her career. She was mostly popular in England. Um, again, like a lot of these other authors, you know, these, these British British authors who kind of slowly uh, made their you know made their living, you know, publishing reams of you know supernatural fiction. Um, so yeah, she was mostly popular in England. Although her first book of short stories was published, which was published in the U.S., uh, Kexies and Other Twilight Tales uh, from 1976, was printed by Arkham House. Um, you know, the very important weird fiction publishers who kept people like Lovecraft alive and published other authors like um, Ray Bradbury and such, you know, very devoted to weird fiction. So it seems like her reputation has kind of slowly gained in, in recent years. And based on this, I can see why. Like, it's just a very, she's just, this is just a very good, 
excellent, just classical Christmas ghost story, and, and I loved it. So I really definitely, again, another author that I need to look into. Again, this is one of my favorite stories in the collection. They really, they really backloaded a lot of the best stories toward the end of the, the collection here. So I'll, yeah, another author I really need to look into. The next story is A, a Strange Christmas Game by Mrs. J.H. Riddell from 1868. This one was okay. A very uh, a spooky, but, you know, very generic ghost story about, um, you know, these people in a house, you know, witnessing some ghosts reenacting a, a, a murder and, and, and investigating some mysterious disappearances and uncovering an old secret. Not bad, not particularly memorable. J.H. Riddell's real name was Charlotte Riddell, mostly known, again, for her collections of ghost stories. Um, apparently, a lot of which have been uh, anthologized and a lot of well-known anthologies like the Fontana book of great ghost stories. There's a ton of those. Um, very popular in, in the UK. So again, some UK viewers might have r uh, run into her before. Um, she's also part owner and editor of St. James's Magazine, which apparently was a popular uh, Victorian magazine in the 1860s. Um, but again, couldn't really find out a whole lot of information about her. And based on the story, like, I don't know, it wasn't great. It, it was fine. But I mean, coming after the, uh, the Marjorie Bowen story, it really didn't compare. Um, not great, not memorable, but, you know, not terrible. The story after that was Calling Card by Ramsey Campbell. This is the most recent story in the collection. This was published in 1982. Um, I tend to run hot and cold on Ramsey Campbell. Uh, this is one of his more entertaining stories. Ramsey Campbell, he tends to be a practitioner of very quiet horror. Um, there tends not to be any kind of overt frights in any of his stories, which sometimes can be really, really good, really, really well done and really effective. Other times it can kind of put you to sleep, at least in my opinion it can. This is a very short, spooky thing. I enjoyed it. It, it was very atmospheric. Um, about a woman who's convinced that she's kind of being stalked by this um, drowned ghost. Uh, the main thing that I liked about the story was a lot of the creepy moments that Campbell kind of pulled out of the you know the story the the, the ghost being a, a drowning victim. Um, the way that he describes the wet slap of the footprints as they get closer. Um, you know the gurgling voice. Um, the stains left on the walls and things like that. You know, you never, it's one of those things where you never directly see the ghost, but you kind of like hear it and, 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 and see kind of left, leftover sort of remnants of its visitations. I really, really liked that. That was really spooky. The various uh, sensations, the textures, the way that he describes the paranoia of the narrator as sort of a, the, the visitations kind of ramp up. It was an enjoyable story. I, I, I liked it. As I said, I go hot and cold on Ramsey Campbell, but this was a good one. And again, not much I need to say about Ramsey Campbell. He's one of the most popular weird fiction authors of the modern era. Incredibly influential, incredibly popular. Um, written um, stories like A Scared Stiff. In fact, this uh, story was uh, it was originally published in an, in an anthology, uh, 65 Great Spine Chillers in 1982, and then it was reprinted in his own collection, Dark Companions, which a lot of people say is one of his best uh, collections of short, stor short stories, and I actually have a copy of it, so that's another one I need to get to at some point. So yeah, very influential modern supernatural fiction author, and this is one of his more enjoyable ones. I like this one. As I said, I go hot and cold on him, but I liked this one. And then finally, this is the, the, the final story in the collection, and, and this was a wonderful way to end it. It ends with another Charles Dickens collection, which I think you, know, you really couldn't have ended it any other way. This is a, a Christmas Tree, published in 1850. Um, yeah, as I said, th this was a wonderful, wonderful uh, ending story. It's, it's very experimental. Um, it's kind of a long-winded reminiscence on sort of Christmas memories, um, mixed in with spooky tales. Um, so it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's from the perspective of this uh, adult man kind of looking back on his Christmas memories, uh, largely heavily implied to be autobiographical, maybe based on some of uh, Charles Dickens' own memories of Christmas, looking on this uh, giant, cr giant glowing Christmas tree with, you know, tinsel and lights and things. And, and, he, and he sort of imagines all of these creatures and objects sort of connected to various Christmas memories kind of arising out of it and, and enveloping him. And he weaves in memories of Christmas itself, of things that happened to him on Christmas, with memories of some of like toys that he received and um, sort of creepy ghosts, ghostly visitations that uh, were sort of passed around, you know, word of mouth. And in, in so doing, it almost makes the story this kind of uh, overall commentary on like the nature of, of spooky Christmas tales itself, almost like uh, reminiscing on the very... Uh, on the very sort of tradition and, and just turning it into this beautiful sort of evocation and a tribute to this whole big thing of, you know, Christmas and of the spooky side of Christmas. It was just lovely. I really, really loved it. And there's some really 
captivating imagery in this. Like he talks about like this creepy mask that he received one year as a child for Christmas and how the mask kind of haunted him. That was one of the other things that was interesting and that, that made it feel kind of like this universal sort of commentary is that there's stories of his own memories and of creepy things that he experienced. And then there's woven into that, there's stories of other people, you know, your, your typical like word of mouth sort of urban legends that have been passed around from person to person woven into these personal reminiscences. And they all kind of come together in this beautifully spooky and, uh, and, and, and captivating melange of uh, Christmas and spookiness and ghosts. And I just, I just loved it. It was so great. It was just the, the perfect way to end the collection. Note perfect, in my opinion. And this was originally published in the December 1850 edition of Dickens' own magazine, Household Words, which apparently this was kind of a, a, a yearly tradition of his, was to publish some kind of Christmas-related story in the magazine every year. It was largely, uh, again, largely said to be autobiographical, and you can certainly read it that way. It kind of feels like a series of personal remembrances and kind of half-imagined stories that he might have actually heard growing up that, were, that he kind of reinterpreted. So yeah, a great ending to the collection. Really wonderful, and um, I really enjoyed that. So yeah, that was... Uh, Christmas ghosts, 17 great ghost stories in the Christmas tradition. There's something about the intersection of ghosts and Christmas and horror and just something about it that's so captivating. And I, and I think this book captures all of those various moods very well. You know, you've got some spooky stories, you've got some humorous stories, you've got ones that are kind of in between, you've got stories that are more supernatural, kind of less supernatural, you've got stories that are more experimental stories that are, you know, crowd pleasers. I can see why Catherine Kramer and David G. Hartwell are very well respected as editors, because this is a really, the stories in this are really well selected, paced really well, chosen from a gamut of all kinds of different authors and styles. Of course, they all kind of broadly fit into that very old-fashioned, you know, Christmas ghost story tradition, but um, just seeing the, the many ways that that, that uh, theme or that, that tradition can kind of permutate itself, the very, you know, the permutations of the Christmas ghost story tradition, I think, is what makes this uh, really worth reading, especially during this time of year. So if you can track down this co this uh, this book i highly recommend it and as i mentioned at the beginning of the video there's something of a there's a, a sort of a follow up to this collection called um christmas spirits which uh was published in 1989 and um features some more modern um types of stories you know more from the the 20 the, the mid to late 20th century more contemporary so um i'll definitely be checking that out at some point as well um, maybe I'll read it uh, in January, you know, just to kind of keep the whole spooky winter theme going. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, this, as I said, this is a lot more in-depth than I normally go, but I thought this would be a fun little sort of celebration of the uh, Christmas tradition of ghost stories. So I hope you're all having a wonderful holiday. I hope you're all staying warm and uh, having a good time with family and friends. Maybe you can uh, keep this going yourself. Maybe you can uh, pull up a chair and get a roaring fire going, pass around some hot cocoa and uh, tell some spooky tales. Um, balance out some of that uh, relentless Christmas positivity with some uh, Christmas spooks. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year, and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Bye!